this uh, huge complex was left up for sale. And my master went there. Somebody says, well, there's a mental hospital for sale, but it's really huge, too big. Uh, but he says, I want to see it. They said, look, it's too big. He said, I want to see it. <laughs> and he goes, and it's huge. It's like 80 buildings and 400 acres of land or something. So he goes there, and, and he stands in the middle of the gym. And he says, this is a perfect place for Buddhism. And, and everybody's, one, a woman says, well, I'll, I'll pay for it. I'll buy it. He says, no. I want everyone to buy it. I want everyone to come here and work and pay for it. This belongs to the world, to everyone. So he had a, a few American disciples who came from the University of Washington to study with him. And they all put their pennies together, and they were able to buy this property. It's an extraordinary place. So he was there in, in a room that used to be a design center. When the hospital was there, they had a cottage industry, and they designed clothes, and they gave uh, shows to sell their clothing. And he was in that room, a Palladian. And he said, wisdom is just changing your bad habits. Recognizing your faults and changing them. Well, you know, I didn't think of wisdom as like that. I thought wisdom is, you know, being an Einstein, being very smart, being very intelligent. But what he said sounded true to me. And like I heard it before and forgot it. Then afterwards, we went down to the Buddha Hall, and, and the nuns and the monks walked around the Buddha Hall, chanting. In the front line was an American bhikshuni, that's a nun. And, and I looked at her, and I saw something I'd never seen before. And it struck me as virtue. She had been practicing for, she was married and had a child and a husband and everything, but she decided to become a nun. And she'd been practicing for a few years. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I really want to be a nun and a Buddhist nun. And, and this virtue, I want to see if I can, I can have some virtue. I can develop my virtue. That was in 1981. So at 1983, I, I finished my, actually, I I finished a book. I was writing a book on nutrition, <laughs> and I, I studied nutrition. I studied Chinese medicine. So I put together a combination of Chinese medicine and, and Western medicine a diet, you know, a cookbook, a cookbook called uh, The East and West Meats. But anyway, I, worked on, I wanted to finish that book, so I did finish it, and then I went to the city of 10,000 Buddhas and... As a layperson, I had a degree in, in teaching, so we have a school there. We had one classroom, one, one room. We had children from Laos and Vietnam because this was after the war, and we accepted the refugees there as a training center. I have a master, set that up. So one, just a one, one room, and there was me and another teacher, that's how I began, began my, my life. And I, my parents are from Mississippi. They, they're farmers. And they never even sent a Chinese or Vietnamese. I mean, I just could not become a, a left-home person until they passed away. So I made that vow. And so when my parents pass away, then I will become a left-home person. And so eventually, that came to fruition. As a teacher, I, I love the stories the, of Buddhism. I love the sutras. I love the text. 
I love the teaching. But there weren't any books in our school for children about Buddhism. Nothing. So I made a vow that I would write books for children. I would rewrite the Buddhist stories in children's language. So I began that endeavor. And I called it Instilling Goodness Books. So that's what I've been doing over the years, is teaching in the schools and writing books. Now, over, over sutras, uh, sutras, if you're Theravada, our sutras, our sutras were mostly in Chinese. They had never been translated into English. Our master says, you know, anywhere you go in the world, you go to a hotel, you open the drawer, and there is a Bible. He says, it's because the Chinese have not translated Buddhism into English. English. He said, this is a great fault. And he, he was young. He was like, he hadn't even gone to school then. Oh, yes, actually he had. He, I must go back. He said, he told his disciple very clearly, if you ever talk about me, tell people how stupid I am. <laughs> so my master was really stupid. Uh, <laughs> He, he didn't go to school until he was 16 years old. That's how stupid he was. And then he went to school for only two years. The reason why he, he memorized all the books in the school, there wasn't any, anything else for him to study there. And the war came, the Japanese war came. And his mother became ill. And so he, he didn't go to school anymore. He went home to take care of his mother. But he said, here I am, you know, I, I have a room. He says, I'm going to give my room up. I'm going to sleep in the kitchen. And I'm going to make my room into a school. And I'm going to have all the farmers, all the farming children, they're on the farm, to come to my school for free. I'm not going to charge anything. At that time in China, you had to pay quite a bit of money to go to school. School was not free to anyone. So he couldn't go to school anyway. His father couldn't afford it. So it, there was no chance for him to go to school. But he did, actually, he managed to, to go to school for two years because a doctor paid for his tuition. Anyway, he was so stupid, he gave his room up, and, and he, all the kids from school came, and, and they all studied with him. He taught them whatever he knew. Then later on, someone gave him a bigger building, that's how stupid he was, he said. <laughs> and he said, you know, I'm so stupid. I, I, I think that, that the Chinese uh, sutras should be translated into languages, and they only speak Chinese. Now, isn't that stupid? You know, how can I possibly uh, translate all these books into, into uh, English? Well, later on, because of the war and because of different things that happened in his life, he came to San Francisco, and he started teaching meditation, put aside on his story, meditation classes. And an uh, American student from Seattle, Washington State, was on, vac on break. And he saw the sign, went in, and says, oh, go in and try meditation. So he goes into the hall. There are a few Chinese there. And there's this old master sitting there at the back. And he began to sit there, and all of a sudden, after days of sitting, he realized that the master was not ordinary. He was special. So he invited his classmates at Washington State to come down to San Francisco and for a meditation session with the master during the Christmas break. And that's what happened. From then, well, we're who we are now. <laughs> We're at the city of 10,000 Buddhas. So I begin my, my study of Buddhism without knowing anything. And I was, I, was, I was very, very, very surprised. I thought Buddhism was sitting in meditation, learning the life of the Buddha, doing a few chants, and that was it. 
Well, I find out it's much, much more than that. For one thing, I had to learn Chinese <laughs> because I was ceremonies in half Chinese. One day was in Chinese, and next day was in English. So I began to learn Chinese and to study the sutras. Well, over the years, I was so attracted to the sutras that I, I began, I made a vow then that I would have to translate the sutras into English. And I can, I can actually read a lot of Chinese. I can't speak it. So right now, my, my job is to write children's books and to work on translation teams. I do the English, policy English. And over the years, I have become very uh, brazen, <laughs> as to say, because uh, the you know, Chinese scholars who come to our university, and, and they insist that it be translated exactly like the Chinese. And I say, but it doesn't sound strange in English. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't sound right. So over the years, I've been uh, kind of battling. At the same time, improving my skills and, and convincing people that, uh, and convincing the Chinese that it really has to be, has to be English, that, that is fun and light and eloquent and wonderful and beautiful to read. And you know what? Over the years, I'm winning the battle. <laughs> along with others because our, our translations are getting really, really wonderful. Uh, you may wonder, how did I survive? Actually, over the years, the monks and nuns, they were American, but they all began to leave because we had other temples, and the masters sent them to other temples. And finally, I was only one of the only few Westerners there. So I, when I left the home life, I, the day I was ordained, the temple was full of Chinese. There weren't any Westerners there. I go outside the temple, and all the families were there. They came from China, from Taiwan, from Malaysia to congratulate their, their uh, sons and daughters for becoming monks and nuns. There was no one there to greet me. I was the only Westerner, and I looked out, and I thought, well, on my own. So that's kind of the way it was. Uh, I was sent to a training center. I was the only Westerner there. And immediately, the manager of the monastery asked me to be her assistant which means I'm with her all day. I'm on the telephone. I'm going to meetings with the city hall because there are a lot of legal things we had to do to have a monastery. This was in uh, Sacramento. And whenever I was in the kitchen, I was always called away. So it was tough. I actually didn't have any friends <laughs> because I found out later on uh, the culture, the Chinese revered me because I was an assistant to the manager, but they also feared me because I knew they thought I knew everything that went on and that I would be uh, sneaking on them. Anything they do that I could report to the manager because in the culture, that's probably what would have happened. So it was, uh, I was alone again, and here I, over the years, it's kind of been like that. I've kind of been, for, for some reason, I've always been in situations where I was the only Westerner <laughs> around. But, um, you know, the Chinese people, are, their culture is, is, is amazing. I tried to learn. I've cried <laughs> over the years, but I've managed to to live through it and to be here. But to, oh, to close, I'm going to tell you one very funny story that just, that I was in the kitchen and we were going to peel the apples. Now, I picked up an apple and the nun next to me picked up an apple, the very same size, same color, everything. She picked up a cleaver, you know, the Japanese cleavers, 
and uh, put the upper down on the cardiogram again. Chop, 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 chop. And I got a parry knife, <laughs> a little tiny knife. And she chop, 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 and she picked up her apple was perfect. And with my parry knife, I cut a ring around it. You know how we do it? And my apple was perfect, just perfect. She said, boo how? No good, no good. I said, but it's, you know, it, it, it's okay. She said, no, 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 no. She handed me a Chinese cleaver. <laughs> and so I began to chop, 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 chop. And pretty soon I had an applesauce. All over the floor, all over the wall around me, all over the sink, I had applesauce. And I had about this much of an apple left. And I held it up to her and she said, how? Good, good. Next time you do better. <laughs> so this is kind of what has been happening over the years as a, you know, as a Nasik and a, and a Chinese. But I, I'm very grateful for it and I'm very grateful to be here. How's every time now? Sadhu, sadhu. Mm. Thank you for the talk. And um, we have a special opportunity to ask uh, Venerable Jin Rosher other questions or bring up other um, topics to discuss. Uh, and. We can go back and forth a bit. Um, we will need someone to uh, move the mic from the questioners to the stage and back and forth, because we only have one mic um, at the moment. And don't turn the mic off, because it will yell at us, as we've discovered. So do we have an assistant uh, who would be willing to be the mindful mic? Quick walker, sigh, great. Um, before we, and if you're uh, joining us via YouTube, you can actually join us via Zoom if you want a slightly more intimate experience just by uh, clicking on the link on the page. And if you're on Zoom, raise your hand and uh, you can ask a question in person actually, well, via the large screen. Um, so we've really tried to make this a bit more of an integrated experience. Um, before we begin, Venerable Jin Rusher, can I ask if there's, um, what the most inspiring moment uh, you had with Master Hua ever was, the one that sort of has stuck with you the most. And this is the, the master that you were speaking of. When I went to the city of 10,000 Buddhas, the master was in his close to 80, and he was, he was very old. And he told everyone, he says, my, my time is over, but I have a lot of work to do. I have internal work to do for the entire world. And so I don't want anyone to talk to me. I, I won't take any new disciples. And when you're, when you're on the road, just recite the Buddha's name. Don't stop and bow to me or talk to me because I am busy. He was very, very ill, very, very sick at that time, but he continued to go anyway. And, and he told everyone, he says, now we have a new disciple here, meaning me, Gobe. And he says, she has a question, you know, um, don't come to me. Don't bring her to me. You answer the question. This is your job. This is what I'm leaving with you. And so every time I have a question, the monks are not, no, no, wait, I'll go, I'm going to take you to the master. I said, no, he told me to not come to him, to not, to not bother him. And so the, this, this moment here was, was really, it's very precious to me. You would think I would have wanted to see him and talk to him, but, but I didn't. I was very happy with his, with, with his needs. And, and so I, I did not really encounter him, him as, as a person. But one day I was teaching and I was taking my students to gather strawberries. 
And, and he stopped me, and he says, Go Bay, have your children learned the rules for being a student? This is a chi the Chinese have the standards for students. There are rules that students have to learn. And I says, yes, I have. <laughs> yes, I have. He said, I want to hear them to re recite. And so the children recited the standards, the rules for him. And he was very happy. He said, ho, 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 ho. I also, um, I don't know if this is a true story, but I kept hearing it that there was one disciple who um, had a really soft spot for uh, pies. And he was early on in his monastic life, and it was very strict at the monastery that you eat just before noon. and He'd gone to this pie shop every now and again. He would go and get like a bunch of pies and just sort of, um, you know, have have a day of it. And uh, he couldn't finish all the pies, so he like brought one back to the monastery. And all afternoon, he was just thinking his meditation about the pie. And then by the end of the day, he's like, "All right, I'm just gonna." So he went up to the roof, um, to like this little place, sort of hidden behind a, a like a thing, just where no one ever went, up this sort of fire escape, and sort of was having his pie. And then he heard this door open, like the, the little hatch. And he's like, who is that? Like, no one ever comes up here. And uh, so he like furtively hid the pie away and started doing walking meditation. And it was, it was Master Hua. And Master Hua just silently began doing walking meditation right next to him. So they're both like silently, quickly walking back and forth. And then after about five minutes, Master Hua just cracked up and said, was it delicious? <laughs> and uh, that was... I think I've heard a few different versions of that, and I'm sure I have it wrong. Really? Okay. Uh, this has, Seattle really has, a, really, really has their footsteps in Buddhism because later on, this disciple became, he wanted to do a bowing pilgrimage from, from uh, the city of 10,000 Buddhists to Seattle because he was from Seattle. And so he actually did this. He and, an, and another monk actually bowed all the way from Ukiah, California, to Seattle. And they had a, a pull cart. And they had a tent in it. And they actually set up on the road. They, they did it. They came all the way to Seattle. And so at the end of their bow, bowing, the master brought all the disciples up in a bus. And they're going to meet them and have lunch with them. And so they did. So whenever the disciples sat down at his plate, there was a plate full of pies that the master had got, especially for him. And the master said, eat, 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 eat all you want to. <laughs> all right. Um, any questions or things people would like to ask? It's a special opportunity, so don't be shy, please. I'm Mark, uh, Venerable. Um, we have this concept in, in the Theravada, and I, I don't know if it's in the Mahayana, uh, so stop me if it is, but the, the character types, greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, how does one come to know one's character? We don't particularly have one because actually we're all we have all of them <laughs> to a strong degree. Uh, but but the master gave us six six principles that he told us to live by, and this will cover everything if you can do even one of them. The first was no fighting, no greed, no seeking. It means to seek out yourself, seek outside yourself. You should know yourself. You should develop from within and not depend on the outside source. 
and um, no, no selfishness, no uh, personal advantage. Whatever you do, you do for others as well as for yourself. And the, the last one is uh, telling the truth, no lying. It's the closest I can get to that. <laughs> Uh, it was interesting doing the aura meditation. It's the first time I've done anything like that. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I'm curious about, uh, you know, the aura being seven feet or certain chakras having colors. Are there, are those experienced as realities in deep meditative states? What's the, how did that's those sort of consensus be how are those arrived at i'm wondering the most of the information from auras comes from india but not that other um, traditions don't experience of course so uh, this came from high masters who actually experienced the colors. They could see the colors and feel the colors and know the colors. And there is an amazing amount of information about, about the chakras. And, and the Chinese also uh, use them to a certain degree. The master did not teach it to us. But, uh, but uh, the, the Chinese medicine, Chinese kind of cover that in Chinese medicine a lot. And if you're on Zoom, feel free to raise your hand, or if you're on the live stream, type in a question if you'd like. Um, Venerable, I'm curious how you see the paths of the Theravada and Mahayana, where they resonate. Um, how can we inform our practice with some of the insights that you've found particularly salient or strong within the Mahayana tradition? I can, the Vendra Master actually teaches a lot of the Theravada traditions. Actually, he says in America, Buddhism is new. You're like kindergartners, all of you. You know, he says in China, they have, school, they have a school, a meditation, one where you study the sutras, one where you recite the Buddhist name. They have all these different schools and very elaborate. But he says in America, make it very, very simple. I'm going to teach you a little bit of all of them so that you, you, uh, you can be diverse in them, and then you, you can decide then what, where you want to go from there. So when, when the master was young and he was exploring Buddhism, he went to Thailand to study and to practice with the Thai monks, and he admired them greatly. He says they worked very, very hard. And he spent some time there. He met the king. And when the master left Thailand, the king cried. Because <laughs> our master was uh, a very admirable person. So when he came to America, he says, uh, this thing of Mahayana and Theravada, he says, this is for people who have nothing to do. He says, in America, we had to make Buddhism alive. We had to make it for everyone. <laughs> and so he, he went to England, to the, you know, to Amaravati, and, and he invited the monks from the Theravada tradition to come to the city of 10,000 Buddhas and to bring their, to, to exchange robes with us. We used to wear gray and, and uh, black. Those are the colors in China, gray and black and brown. And he now, now we wear gold. 
And the reason why, because the master asked the monks in Amaravati uh, to bring their robes to us, uh, their color, and to, to bring their bowls to us. So they did. They came from, from, New, from England. They came to our the city of 10,000 Buddhists. And there was a beautiful ceremony where the Theravada monks handed our monks their bowl and their robes, the color, this color. It, it was fabric to make robes this color. And so this, this is how, how it, it is. And then he asked us to recite the very uh, same chant we did today. And the Buddha Hall hit us. One day we did it in, in uh, did the Thai, you know, your tradition. We recited chanting one day. We chant one day in Pali. We chant the next day in English and the next day in Chinese. <laughs> so that was, uh, that's the way he says. He says, he says, no big and no small. You, you, you just follow your heart. There's nothing wrong with either tradition. You can get enlightened by both of them. So. Thank you for that. To give a little also context, um, Master Hua uh, was the disciple of Venerable Xu Yun, one of the legends of China, who many people don't know, but uh, Venerable Xu Yun was born in like about 1840. His father tried to marry him off to three women, and he just taught them Dhamma, and then he ran away to a <laughs> monastery, uh, behind a monastery, lived on river water and pine needles for three years, or two years, until someone found him. Um, and basically, he continued to practice for, uh, he ordained when he was 20. Um, he began the tradition of bowing pilgrimage, which is where you take three steps and did, then do a full-length prostration, which is what the monk that uh, uh, Dharma Master um, is mentioned did from California to Seattle. Um, he, Venerable Shu Yun, which means empty cloud, then visited uh, Thailand, where he taught a retreat in Chinatown. The king came to visit him, but he had this uh, problem where he'd slip into jhana for a week at a time, and no one could get him out. So the king came to visit him, and all the people at the center were just like, yeah, he's in jhana. We, we can't get him out. And the king said, that's fine. Just leave him to it. Um, he basically reinvigorated Chinese Buddhism, uh, the largest monastery in China. And then he lived in a little uh, pigsty in the back as the abbot. And he wouldn't move into the actual monastery. When he, he trained Master Hua, who was uh, Dharma Master's uh, preceptor, and when Venerable Xu Yun was 120 years old, this is well documented, he had his birthday party, and then he passed away after being a monk for exactly 100 years um, at, in about 1960. So Master Hua was his disciple and uh, just a giant. Um, he, uh, his parents passed away, and in homage to them, he lived in this little hut on, um, in the cremation ground where they'd passed for several years, I believe, just in honor of them. And came to the US and started this massive and beautiful movement. And he was just renowned for his uh, practice. And if the fact that we're all here is in large part due to Venerable Master Hua, because uh, Ajahn Amaro in about 1992 uh, or 93 began coming to the US and California, kind of looking to start a monastery. Um, but then the Sangha in uh, England um, there's a wave of disrobles, and they said, actually, we're going to have to hold on and just we need to use what monks we have on the existing monasteries. So they put a hold on it. A few years later, in about 1994 or 95, um, the Sangha finally had a meeting and they said, okay, we have enough monks. Um, Ajahn Amaro, you can go and look into starting a monastery in California again. And that was the evening of, I think, like May 31st or something, or, or May 30th. Um, and then everyone went to bed, and then the next morning, Ajahn Amaro, right after this meeting, was walking down the hallway, and uh, this monk called him in and said, yeah, uh, Ajahn Sumedho just called, and Master Hua just offered us a piece of land, um, literally the day after he'd gotten permission to uh, go into California. 
And that land is what is Abayagiri now. So this tradition um, in the US is in huge debt to Master Hua. And Long Pursumeda, when he met uh, Master Hua for the first time, he said it was the one being he'd ever met who impacted him as much as Ajahn Chah. And both of them acknowledged that they'd spent past lives together as practitioners. Um, and Master Hua was very special in that he carried this lineage of uh, powerful Chinese Chan Buddhism to the West. And uh, it's you know, suspected that a large part of his creating a Bayagiri or helping allow a Bayagiri right next to the City of 10,000 Buddhas, which was his main monastery, was because he saw that these two traditions, the Theravada and the Mahayana, had something to give to each other. So the monks at City of 10,000 Buddhas would come to Abayagiri and learn their vinaya and their code of monastic conduct. Um, and the monks at Abayagiri uh, go to City of 10,000 Buddhas and learn um, their study, um, their uh, approach to social action, and more. And Ajahn Kovilo right now is at that college uh, studying in that uh, sort of school that they set up. So we're in huge debt to the tradition uh, that Venerable Jin Roshi is coming from. And one final thing is that the uh, lay uh, community that supports and um, holds that area of uh, City of 10,000 Buddhas are referred to in the tradition as Dharma protectors. And I really like that term. So I think uh, a monk recently at Abayagiri said they'd been getting so many of our members that they'd started calling us the Clear Mountaineers, which is pretty good. But I like... I like Dharma protectors as well. So, anyways, we're in, we're in huge debt to this tradition, and uh, thank you for joining us again. This shows you how stupid our master is. He had this beautiful mountain piece of land up there that just overlooked the valley, and gave it away. <laughs> Is, um, do we have any other questions on the live stream or in person? Ariel and uh, Venerable, I wanted to ask. Um, it's always really interesting to hear um, Dharma teachers in, in different traditions uh, simply explain what they would say to um, a lay person who's, who's quite unfamiliar with Buddhism or the practice um, to explain it. So my question is, um, in the most simplest, concise way, if uh, a lay person who was very new to the practice asked you, well, what is Buddhism? What is it really about? How would you answer that? You know, actually, Buddhism is not any different that much from any religion, basically. Uh, it's Probably the way we approach it, I, I think, uh, in my case, because every religion teaches compassion and kindness. They teach cause and effect. But Buddhism really goes very, very deeply into cause and effect, very, very strongly. And they also, another difference is in Buddhism, you, you don't look outside for an agent. You don't look for a god or a goddess or or anyone else to so save you, so as to say, you do it yourself. Uh, Buddhism is a guide. It gives you principles and ways to to uh, recognize your yourself and to constantly change yourself with conditions. Uh, you occur with conditions, but do not change. So this is what I would probably say. <laughs> 